Euro 2024 is finally here. Over the next week, we'll be building up to the tournament in Germany with a preview from each group. Today, we do some of the most obscure teams of the tournament in Group E. All right, let's get into the penultimate preview then. It was, of course, Group E. Quite an interesting group. You've got Belgium, Romania, Slovakia and Ukraine. What do you think of it, Harry? Should it be a good, like, toughly contested group? Yeah, I think so. Obviously, Belgium are probably giving the clear ones to, to deal with this group quite easily. But I think the three teams behind them are the ones that are going to bring the, the excitement to this group. It's going to be a very, very fun battle for that second place against three three very good sides who are in very, very good form. So I'm intrigued to, to talk about them and get into them. There's a lot of dark horse material in this group, even That's as fair. Belgium. If Belgium were to go, yeah. you know, finalists, you know, maybe even winners, that would be a real upset. And if any of Romania, Slovakia, Ukraine get through into the knockouts, they have that you know ability yeah. to be dark horses in there. Let's start, of course, with Belgium, best ever position of second. They've never won it, but they did. They were runners up once. Manager is Domenico Tedesco. He's not someone who has a load of experience in the game, um, but I think it is definitely an improvement on on Roberto Martinez. Obviously, yeah. Tedesco, one of the managers who really personifies that that very narrow shape we saw of course you know he's come through red ball that's what they love mm. ironically they hate the wings so that will be quite a narrow system but i think he's a good appointment yeah 100 percent. he's a very very good manager and, and he belgium we're hoping that he is the man that could kind of give them something from this tournament belgium have always been the side that we all laugh at because i mean they're third in the fifa world rankings and every time we ask how are they there what yeah. have they done the most recent years well maybe this year Tedesco and Belgium can prove why they're up there, why they are you know, they, they are a very, very good side, and maybe they can do that by bringing home silverware. Yeah, worth noting as well, unbeaten in qualifying, a really, really strong qualifying performance yeah. from Belgium. They basically just rolled over and everyone over in that group, yeah. and it wasn't too difficult a group, to be fair. And I feel there's a lot more positivity around Belgium. A lot of people were worried that once Hazard retires, or Tonga and Aldevera, once they go, the team would be very weak and that their golden generation would be over. But... Yes, their defence is slightly weaker, and yes, of course, they miss Eden Hazard. Yeah. But there is still a really strong core in this Belgium mm. side. A lot of good young players coming through. So I think the future is still bright for Belgium. In terms of a key player, though, I'm not picking one of the young flash ones. I'm picking the top scorer in the Euros qualifiers, Romelu Lukaku. 14 goals Crazy. for Lukaku. Crazy. Someone who had 14 chances in the Champions League final last season can take any of them. But 14 goals he's notched up in the Euros qualifiers. Can he carry that form into the tournament? 100%. Lukaku proves once again that in the right environment he can be a phenomenal striker. He is a very, 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 very talented player on his day. And as in the qualifiers, he had an absolute barnstormer. And if he can do that at the tournament, Belgium are right on the money because he is a dangerous player in form. Romelu Lukaku can score against any goalkeeper in the world, any defence yeah. in the world. He is that kind of striker. He gets clowned on for his time at United and his time at, well, see at Chelsea as well. Last few years for Lukaku, been a shit show, basically. But if he can make this tournament, it's where he can pick his career, end on a high, started well, dipped in the middle, soaring up maybe with a Euros win and he can fire Belgium to glory. But yeah, it very much depends on what version of Lukaku you get. Because if you get the one that is really confident up for it like he has been for yeah. Belgium like he was at the start actually at Chelsea before he got Covid and then decided to do an interview where he basically slagged everyone off for some reason before that he was playing really well he, he scored some goals for Thomas Tuchel it seemed to, everything seemed to be going well for the Blues I think they are in the top four at the time and um, then it all fell apart after that but if you get that confident Lukaku that one that is motivated to play you've got a really good player there if you get the the lazy one the slow one yeah. that's not really mobile it might be a, a bit more difficult. Tactically, though, 4-3-3 for Belgium is how we expect it to go. I think Thibaut Courtois will now come in. When I made this, Courtois was still out injured, but considering he played the Champions League final, I think he'll come back in goal there. In the back four, Tiate, Vertonghen, Debast and Castagna, a strong back four there. But again, they do miss some quality centre-halves. I think Vertonghen at his old age and Debast not really what you want in there. I mean, the next best option, about face. Could we see him play? Potentially, but mm. I think it will be that partnership. In the midfield three, it's Yuri Tielemans, uh, Amadou Onana, and of course, Aurel Mangala. That's, good. That's a really strong midfield three, I think. Now, again, I think De Bruyne will likely come back into that. I've completely forgot to include him, but he will be in over Mangala. I've only just realised that. And then a front three, of course, of Trossard, Lukaku, and Doku. So, yeah, a really strong team. In fact, I will I will amend that lineup yeah. before. The, but, yeah, you'll see on screen there, De Bruyne and Courtois. And that, but it is a strong team. Yeah, very much so. They are a very, very talented side. And as you say, they're kind of, obviously, 
yes, they lost quite a bit of their golden generation in terms of you know, talk about your Hazards and your Alderweireld and your Nyangalan and players like that. But they've been adequately replaced by talent coming through. Yeah, I'd like to shout out for Nyangalan there. I don't Ooh, think he's ever been in the same conversation as Edin Hazard, though. Yes, I think but, yeah, so. Fair that enough. mohawk was enough for me. <laughs> Each to their own. But yeah, I think he's... Um... No, I think Bergeron got a really good shot this tournament. I really like Jeremy Doku as well. I think he could be a, a real yes. X factor for them in this tournament. I think Leandro Trossard's really gone from strength to strength this season for mm-hmm. Arsenal. So I think they will be uh, they'll be much better in that regard. Let's move on to Romania, another side who are unbeaten in qualifying. A really good, really really good uh, record for them. Wow, I mean, what a qualifying campaign from Romania! Really, I mean, they came out the blocks fast, and I think they've hit, surprised all of us. They have been absolutely brilliant. Yeah, um, since yeah, the, the new manager came in, they've been they've looked in brilliant touch. They look like yeah. a very very good unit. Then they look like a side who, on their day, can challenge big sides. You can get points off teams that we wouldn't expect them to. This could be a positive. Uh, things are on the up for Romania, and getting to this tournament and being here and challenging once again is is the best example of that. Yeah, Eduard Iordanescu, obviously the manager. He's come in and they've done really really well. They kept six clean sheets in the group stage, which is the second most of anyone in yeah. qualifiers. Only Portugal with nine had more. So clearly Romania are doing something well there. Defensively, they are, they're very solid. I do think they lack, again, going forwards. We've spoken about this with quite a few teams now, quite yeah. a lot of those, those smaller sides. They'd set up really well defensively, but they lack that penetration, especially when they're going to be going up against a really strong defence in Belgium. I think they might they might struggle in that regard. So and I mean Slovakia as well in this group also have a strong defence. We'll get onto that in a moment. Let's talk um a star player. Yanis Hadji, I think I will put in that conversation. They've got quality elsewhere in the squad, but I think Hadji is probably the most quality that player they have. He's the most yeah. individualistic, most star man type role, I, I think you could argue. Yeah, hundred percent. Not see the name of Hadji carrying a lot of weight and of a course. lot of potential for him. He is a very, very good player. And again, this could be a tournament for him where he really shines and they're going to need him to turn up. Romania, the lowest scoring nation out of all the teams that have qualified for the tournament. They need to find goals in the in the group stage. If not, they will find themselves in a very, very sad situation where they're bottom of the group. Things look promising for Romania. They just need to find the back of the net more often. Hadji can do that for them. Yeah, let's talk tactics then. It looks like it'll be a, a 4-1-4-1, 4-3-3 mm. type shape in goal. Ironically, they've got someone Moldovan. Um, his name is Moldovan. No, he's not. Quite, I don't think he's from Moldova, unfortunately, but that is quite ironic. Brilliant. In the back four, Banchu, Berka, Dragusin, of course, now at Tottenham, probably the, the star in that defence, and Ratiu. I think that's a really strong defence, and they will be looking just to just to deal with that. Dragusin put up really, really strong clearance numbers, really strong block numbers. And again, if he can do that, if he can throw himself in front of every ball and defend with his heart on the sleeve like you'd expect from a from a, this Romanian defence, then that could definitely be helpful. In defensive field, I think it'll be Skrekiu and then a midfield of Stanchiu and Marin. That's quite a, a, a well-balanced midfield, I would argue. Mm. On the left-hand side, it's Dragos, which is a great name. On the right-hand side, Yanis Hadji and leading the line, Pushkas. Now, if he can channel the energy of Ferenc Pushkas, Romania will win the tournament. I'm not sure he will, but you never know. I mean, what year is it with Hadji and Pushkas playing? <laughs> exactly. This is incredible, but yeah. They're Little very... Eastern Europe combined yeah. 11 going on. They're here. really, really good uh, defensively. They're a strong unit. They just need to find the back of the net. If they can do that, they've got a very, very good chance because realistically, I think that looking at the form they're in, the way they're playing, they've got a good chance of getting out of this group. Yeah, and obviously first tournament since 2016. It's great to see yeah. Romania back Only involved. Up. Definitely. Let's get then to Slovakia up next. And it's their, they've never reached further than the round of 16 before. So they'll be hoping they can get out of the group and match their best ever tournament finish. I, I'm not sure on Slovakia. Again, I feel it's another side who really lack the ability to find the back of the net. They kept a fair number of clean sheets, four clean sheets in qualifiers. That's quite strong. Um, considering that I think they only had eight games. I think they were in one yeah, of those yeah. uh, groups of five. So that's quite strong. Manager Francesco Calzona's doing quite well with them. It's his first role in management. He's been assistant manager for 15 yeah. years. He came in as Slovakia manager this season. He did well enough to earn himself the interim position at Napoli, Three which years. he held from yeah. February to, to now, of course, where Antonio Conte will replace him. But... Yeah, he's done really well, and obviously getting Slovakia back into the back into the Euros is a really good achievement. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, Slovakia coming into this tournament is the second lowest ranked side apart from Georgia. This is going to be a very interesting group for me because, I mean, from Slovakia's point of view, they haven't played Ukraine since two thousand and eighteen, 
and they haven't played Romania or Belgium since 2013. So uh, uh, this is like the. I mean, there's no head-to-head. There's barely a head-to-head record yeah. for Slovakia against these two sides. So it's unknown. It's been a very, very long time since they've played any of these nations. That's quite interesting. You know, it, maybe they can start to. They can be Belgium. They can be Belgium's bogey team. We don't know that. Do we? Potentially, love the love the stats there. Uh, I'm going to go for the key player, Milan Skriniar. Now there are a couple others you could pick out, but I think Skriniar is the pick of the bunch. He is a fantastic defender. Of course, the defensive numbers speak for themselves. But I think something that people will consider less is his ability with the ball at his feet. He is a really, really strong passer. And Slovakia, a lot of their goals have come from those long balls in behind. His long ball accuracy was one of the highest out of all players in qualifiers yeah. because Slovakia are going to look to play that ball long. They're going to look to get in behind and, and try and hit teams quickly. With a player like Skriniar, with the range of passing he has, they can definitely cause issues because they can move that ball so far and they can make the pitch wide. They can play expansive football. So I do think that helps them massively having a centre-half there who can who can play out from the back. It looks yeah. like it'll be a 4-3-3, so let's look at it tactically. In goal, it looks like Marek Rodak has been preferred over Martin Dubrovka, but I guess we'll see what happens in that yeah. role. You know, either or goalkeeper, either goalkeeper will be very solid. In the back four, it's Hanko, who plays for Feyenoord and is a really strong defender. Skriniar, Satska and Pekarik. Satska, I think, scored the most recent friendlies. Um, quite a very aerial guy. He's very tall, so that will help him out. In midfield, it will be Lajlo, Benes, Duda and Kutka, I believe, will be in there as well. That is a quite bad midfield. I know um, Kutka is like 37 now, but he is still good enough. Mm. He's played for teams like Watford, AC Milan for a bit. Most famously, I think Genoa was the team he was at yeah. for ages. So he's bounced around clubs like that. Lajlo, Benes, of course, any fans of Gladbach or... Um, What's that now? Hamburg will be yeah. very familiar with that name. And uh, J- Duda as well, been someone who's always bounced around the Bundesliga. And then a front three of Mac, Bozenek and Suslov. A very strong team, I, I, would, I would argue. Yeah. I do think there is a bit of a deficiency up front, but a strong, a strong 100%. team. 100%. There is a heavy reliance on their defensive quality, but that can get you through in tournament football. If you defend well enough and can nick a goal or two here and there, then they'll be OK. They'll get through. I mean... Last two ta- Euros, they've got a knack for finishing third, finished third in the group in both 2016 and 2020 editions. That can get you through. If they draw yeah. all three games, get three points. Being th- the third place team on three points could be enough. You never know. It could be enough to get through to the knockouts. For Slovakia, they're going to give it a shot. They're going to do what they can. It's very, good, very, very difficult. But overall, they'll fancy themselves against Romania, fancy themselves against Ukraine to get enough points and to get through to the knockouts. Well, let's move on to Ukraine then. Now, I think there's so much more weight, obviously, given the situation in Ukraine, given the conflict um, impacted, you know, the impact in the country right now. So that will be an added thing. But Ukraine, let's talk about purely football base, have been doing really well in recent years. They held their own in a a qualification group with England and Italy. Beat England at Wembley. Exactly. They only knocked out on, on, you know, and had to go through the playoffs on goal difference to Italy. So very unfortunate in that regard because they were very, very strong in that group. I do still think though they struggle to score goals. So Gankov only got two goals in the Euros qualifiers and he was their only player with multiple goals. Now that demonstrates a clear inability to to finish their chances but they are quite good um they are quite a good defensive side again though they don't create chances either only 10.5 xg that ranked like 31st i think of out of everyone who who was in the qualifiers that's below, below sides like luxembourg like northern ireland yeah. and obviously so many more but that doesn't represent a side that's very very good going forward so i think there are a lot of concerns there they'll be hoping to fix that coming into this tournament yeah 100 percent. you you as simple as that as we spoke about you need to find the back of the net of tournaments but you create we know what we're going to get. They're going to fight hard. They're going to battle. They're going to give it everything they can. They're a very, very strong team in terms of physical strength as well. I mean, they were brilliant in in the playoffs, beating Iceland. They fought, again, they outworked their opposition. And that is what they're so good at, outworking other teams. And if they can do that at the Euros, they will win games. It's as simple as that. They're a decent side, got some decent players. They could cause problems for the, this, the other teams in this group. Yeah, manager then, Sergei Rebrov. He's not someone who will be a household name with many people out there, but for anyone in uh, Eastern Europe, for anyone uh, you know in Ukraine, Hungary, in um, in many in a couple of Asian countries, you'll be familiar with him. He is a bit of a title specialist. He won titles, obviously, with Dinamo Kiev, which isn't the most difficult thing to do. They at the, the, the time he was managing, they were the dominant force. Yeah. Obviously, now 
Um, they still are in a sense, but they are, you know, it has been a little bit more contested with obviously Shakhtar and teams like that. Frank Varos then in Hungary, he went there and, and won everything. Again, it's not the most difficult thing to do, mm. but he has got experience winning titles. Alain as well. So he knows what it takes to win things and he knows how to cultivate a, a team and and motivate a team to go out there and, and do a job. Uh, key player then. I'm going to go a little bit outside of the mould here. I'm going to go for Mikhailo Mudrik. My, in my opinion, Mudrik biggest thing is his discipline because he at Chelsea what what we saw when he was really good at Shakhtar was he was playing it was a very weird situation because obviously at the time the war just kicked off they were playing a lot of their games in Poland and obviously when they were playing in Ukraine they didn't have the freedom of movement so they were very much in in a camp you're with the team the whole time when they were playing in Poland again far from home you don't really know people you're not really going out partying he's come to Chelsea and obviously that freedom suddenly a thing and you can do what you want. There's a lot more. There's a lot less restrictions, obviously. Mm. With tournament football, you're in a camp, and the sole goal is to go and out and do well. You don't really go out and 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 you know go out clubbing the night before your Euros games. You're in the camp. You do things with the team, and I think that atmosphere, that culture, might suit Mihailo Mudrik really well. That he'll have that discipline. He'll be around the squad constantly. He's not going to have that freedom to go out and, and get distracted. So he'll be able to focus. And I think that'll really benefit him. And I think we might finally see Mudrik deliver on some promise. And I think Chelsea fans will have something to be excited for going into next season. Yeah, on the pitch, he is a very dangerous player. And in tournament football, for 90 minutes, he can cause the defenders lots of problems he needs, he's, refining. Exactly. He needs to finish and those it's, chances it's, though, it's the, the the final touch and the off pitch um, antics that, that let him down but as you say tournament football this is where he gets it can get it right give it go out there be the best player you can be for 90 minutes get your team to the knockouts keep going keep fighting, keep being strong. That's all they can do. Yeah, I, th- I think working closely in that atmosphere, especially with Sergei Rebrov, might be really good just for him to sort of detox from the, the chaos that is being a Chelsea player yeah. right now and, and actually just be focused on the task at hand and improving as a player. And I think we might finally see him uh, refine those skills and become a really, really dangerous player. Uh, obviously, also two assists was the highest anyone got for Ukraine. So really good job from him in the in the qualifiers. Yeah. Let's have a look at the team then. Now in goal, there's a little bit of contention. I've put Anatoly Trubin in there, but it could on, easily be Andre Lunin. Both had really strong seasons. Yeah. Lunin obviously has started to become the Real Madrid, well, has been the Real Madrid start of this season with uh, Courtois out injured. But Trubin has played more games for Ukraine. So I think that'll be an interesting one to weigh up. In the back four, Mikalenko, Svatok, Zabani and Konoplia. I think is their is their strongest back line. You've got Zabani there, a regular Premier League player. In the pivot, it's Stepanenko, the the very experienced now Stepanenko, alongside uh, Alec- Alexander Zinchenko. He's been a real um, figure for Ukraine, a, a real um, the face of the national side for a while now. He's been so good, obviously, for both City and Arsenal in the Premier League. And in that midfield role, I think he'll he'll play really well. Then across the three, Mudrik, Sudikov and Saigankov. You've got the highest sister and highest goal scorer there on the wings. And and, and Georgi Sudikov, who will be looking to try and add to his £60 million price tag. And Shakhtar can try and do another £100 million for a player. And then leading the line, it is La Liga's top scorer. We expect Artem Dovjek. He didn't really do much in the qualifiers. He didn't really play. They, they rotated that. And I think he only notched up one goal. So there are issues there. Dovbiek, a really good player that we saw that for Hirona. If they can create chances, I think in Mudrik and, and Saigankov, you've got Saigankov who plays in that team, yeah. and Mudrik's not far off Savio. No. They're very similar old players. So if you can try and and play that kind of football, get chances for Dovbiek, he should take them. And yeah. I think in this tournament, Ukraine have got a really nice exactly. setup and a really good chance of, of going deep into this. That's thing. There is, the evidence isn't there on the national stage that they can find goals, but if you look at their domestic campaigns, especially for Dovbiek, well, yeah. Sudikov scored loads as well yeah, yeah, yeah. in uh, but, the Ukraine. But they can score goals. They, you know, they have the potential to fire goals, and we spoke about it in other teams in this group. We spoke about it in all our previews. You know, having a proven goal scorer can completely change your tournament. So if Dobiak turns up and performs, if Saikankov, Sudikov, Mudrik, if they're on their game and they create chances and they score goals, Ukraine will qualify. It's as simple as that. They will make it through. They will get through stages of the tournament. And they're a decent defensive unit, very, very good goalkeeper. Strong back line, very good composition in midfield. If they can find the goals, they've got a good chance of going through. 
And for me, that's the thing that will benefit them in this group is the fact that we've spoken about how Romania, Slovakia, Ukraine, all struggling for goals. Definitely not Belgium. The has got 14 of them, which is more than Ukraine notched up in all of qualifying. Oh. But um, you look at those three teams, they've all struggled for goals. The key difference is Ukraine's players have proven in other arenas that they can be really, really consistent yeah. goal scorers. So they've got a lot more hope there as Romania and Slovakia. I mean, Romania are hoping Pushkas becomes Ferenc overnight and Slovakia, Bosanic, who put up a couple goals, more than yeah. anyone did for Ukraine in qualifiers. But is he really someone that's going to lead you to European glory, re- lead you into knockouts? Yeah. Probably not. No disrespect to the lad, but I'm just going to be honest with him there. But it's going to be very interesting. Maybe we'll see a, a, a huge upset while those sides will get through. If I had to give an early prediction, probably Belgium, Ukraine, and then Slovakia and, and Romania fighting out for third. But yeah. I, I guess we'll see. Of course, our predictions coming in two days. Look out tomorrow for Group F's preview. I hope you've enjoyed this preview of Group E. Go back through the catalogue if you want to see A, B, C, or D. Uh, we, of course, have, have previewed every single group. So look out for all of that. On Thursday will be our tournament predictions. Of course, the day for the Euros. Then Friday, we Three. begin our coverage. Three days. Exactly. Three days until Germany, Scotland kicks off. Very, Cannot very wait. excited. And of course, remember, we are covering every single game of the Euros live on this channel. So make sure to hit that subscribe button. Click the notification bell so you're always here uh, to watch it. But yeah, that's everything from us today. Thank you guys very, very much for watching. And we'll see you next time. See ya.